This is Your Money, Your Call. Hello, welcome to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Julia Lee from Bell Direct. If you have a question about shares, our phone lines are open right now on 1300 30 34 35. Or, of course, you can also email us on yourmoney at skynews.com.au from Medellin Financial. Well, the market reaching another fresh 10-year high. Can anything stop it at the moment? We're seeing a great run, not only for the U.S. stock market, for, but for the Australian share market as well. So let's ask our panelists what they see for the market in the first quarter of 2018. At the market, is it just a case of the Australian market being lifted by what's happening in the U.S.? Or are we expecting more optimistic earnings growth from the Australian market? Look, we are seeing earning revisions higher, really across the globe, but particularly, I think, in Australia, what's driving the market at the moment is really the, the materials. Um, we're seeing sort of BHP um, back above $30. Um, Rio Tinto's had an incredible run as well. So those cyclical commodity companies that have had a, a, a good couple of years now, they're starting to sort of kick on and even make higher ground. And we can expect potentially even further upgrades as many analysts start to plug in these higher commodity prices into their models. So I, like Nathan, I think that the February reporting season, the half year of the reporting season will be a, a real big catalyst. If we can get through that unscathed and deliver results, at least in line with some of these revised expectations, then there's no reason why this market can't continue. But as always, you need to be cautious, and the sectors that performed well last year won't necessarily do well again this year. So you've got to be careful of any rotation that might take place out of, say, some of those yield proxies into more cyclicals and, and etc. Okay. Look, I'm typically fairly cautious on resources, um, but I've certainly been sort of caught out by the, the size of the rally that we've seen and how aggressive it's been. Um, BHP's been our go-to probably since the low 20s, just because of that diversification. Um, Galaxy Resources for some more speculative clients, um, that's obviously a play on the lithium space and, and the, the batteries and those sorts of things. So at this point, probably just ride some of the bigger players, Rio or BHP. But over the medium to longer run, you need to understand that commodities are very cyclical. Um, so you've got to take the good with the bad and be quite nimble through this. Okay, so being quite nimble, and cool, I see you nodding your head there. Um, we saw mining services companies really start to come out with a bit more positivity um, last February. Is yeah. it going to continue? Well, Nathan's been big on this for a while. That's for a while I'm nodding my head. And now, even now, I've started to sort of come around to the idea. Many of these things have been beaten up uh, significantly. But although we've seen commodity prices come back, slowly some money starting to drip into that end of the mining services space. I mean, people still are terrorised by memories of things like Forge and Borat Long Ear and so on and so forth. And that will take a bit of time to clear in people's psyche. But I think you're starting to see that. And the longer the commodity prices can be sustained at these levels, uh, particularly those sort of mining services that are required in a steady state operation as opposed to an expiration phase, I think they can continue to do well. But again, you have to understand this is a very sort of volatile and very turbulent end of the market. Um, so it just does depend on the individual. So liking Europe, any part um, of the globe that's a favourite I mean, for you? Europe is considered to be where the US was maybe two years ago, and that's why you're seeing a lot of those fund flows move into Europe, particularly things like European banks, for instance, have been very popular. And I don't see any reason why that can't continue, but often when something looks so obvious, it something else sort of shifts in the global, global landscape. I think even China still looks fairly good, although their headline growth figures are slowing. The consumer strength over in China appears to be quite good. Um, the private sector remains in fairly good shape. A lot of the debt, although it is increasing, a lot of it is held by state-owned enterprises. So I think Europe um, and, and China are the obvious sort of picks there. Um, the US, I think you can still find growth, particularly maybe in sort of the Russell 2000, mm. some of those more domestic orientated um, businesses as that US dollar comes down. Um, that could be an option. Um, so yeah, it just really does depend. Okay, we do have our first caller on the line, so let's go straight to Lisa from the Gold Coast. Lisa, welcome to the show. Great to hear from you. What's your question for our panel tonight? Well, hi, Julia, and hi, fellas. Just wondering, I have APA Group, and um, just it's got, been going a little bit down lately, and was wondering mm. if you think that uh, it might be time to sell or to hold that. And also on Mantra, um, can you just tell me what's going on with Mantra? I know that nobody's sort of been mentioning it lately and uh, yeah, any, any, any views on that? Thank you. touched upon this um, in the opening, this whole sector rotation that you might want to be worried of going into 2018, particularly many of these high yielding type businesses that are ex-growth. Um, they're probably going to come under a bit of pressure as interest rates, not only in the US but globally, move higher. 
um, you'll see some a rotation out of these names into sort of more cyclical names. So APA um, was wonderful when interest rates were going down. Now that interest rates are going up potentially even quicker than people were expecting considering these tax cuts coming through and some of the growth that we're seeing coming out of the US, companies like APA you can probably extend this bow to things like Sydney Airport, Transurban, some of your real estate investment trusts. Uh, you've probably seen a little bit of weakness across the board in most of those names. Yeah. On APA just quickly as well, just aside from the interest rates, they've basically become a monopoly through a lot of acquisitions and that's how they've grown in recent years. There's a big question mark as to whether the regulator is going to continue to allow them just to keep acquiring these pipelines mm -hmm. because they're basically a sole operator in that space. So that's another thing that might stunt their growth going forward. Okay, so an interesting one, APA in that energy infrastructure area. The other one is Mantra Group. We've seen that uh, takeover bid come through from the French group at Core at $3.96, I think it was. The shares of Mantra last trading at $3.91. No one's really expecting a counter bid or anything. Look, I mean, I, at one point I sort of was into Mantra, but it was basically the V-shape, went all the way down and then people, and then this takeover came through and it sort of jumped back up. Um, C-Link was one. Um, obviously, you've had the sort of ardent leisure situation, which has obviously mm. been a, a, a negative for that space and that whole, um, that whole industry, really. But that might be a bit of a bargain opportunity for those looking to, for a bit of a turnaround story. But um, by and large, I've left that space alone in the last sort of 12, 18 months. Thank you, Julia and panel. Um, I have a small holding in a speculative uh, micro cap in the biotech space and it's called Avita Medical. The code for that is AVH. Sure. I would be interested in the panel's view of the prospects of the company. I like the, the story that's being uh, uh, spun by the managing director at the moment. Uh, they have um, a, a skin repair product uh, in the advanced stages of uh, FDA approval in the States sure. and if that seems to work uh, or if that comes through it would seem to all go well for the company but I would be interested in the panel's view. If Basically Nathan sort of touching on a lot of the success of these products isn't whether they work or not it's the commercialization of it and when it comes to healthcare particularly in sort of a clinic environment or hospital environment it's a lot of it is a sales team and your sales mm. drive that you have Behind. I mean, one that's got a lot of coverage over the last few years is Certex Medical. Um, they have a certain um, procedure that helps extend cancer, um, the life of cancer uh, sufferers by a certain amount of time. However, many doctors are very conservative by nature. They would rather stick to the tried and tested method of dealing with many of these things. And it takes a long time to convince them mm -hmm. and a lot of proof to convince them that it's worth uh, adopting these new technologies. So that's probably the situation you have with this company. Uh, I must admit it, it's not one I'm too familiar with at all given it's fairly small. I tend to focus on sort of larger businesses but biotechs by nature should only take up a small portion of your portfolio because really you've got to go through so many different stages. Often there's capital raisings along the way um, to market the product and then those sorts of things develop the product. So. Yeah, look, if you've, if you've been listening to the CEO for a while, you've been following the company for a while, you're probably in a much better position to make the decision than me. Um, I'd really like um, to know about Bubs and Kidman Resources, please. <laughs> um, Bubs has caught my eye just purely because that space over the last sort of couple of years has been going fairly crazy. Um, Bubs is a fairly recent listing and it's been a very um, good performer since it's listed. I think it has been as high as sort of a dollar, dollar ten at some point there. It's now back around sort of the 70 cent mark. I think it is quite well backed um, by the Stokes family, I think, here in Australia. And my understanding is there's a couple of Chinese celebrities associated with the business, whether they're on the board or non-executive directors, something like that. And the idea being that they can take it into China and, and market it quite well. Um, it's a slightly unique offering in that it is goat milk as opposed to cow milk. Um, but that space overall has had an incredible run. There's no reason why it can't continue to grow, but it's just as whether or not those growth rates are going to be enough to satisfy the market given where valuations are. Okay. I also have Michael Wayne and the company is... Tell Medallion us a little... Financial. Medallion so, Financial. Medallion Financial. Tell us a little bit more about Medallion um, fresh, Financial. Fresh Venture, basically it's been going for close to six months now. Um, so we focus mainly on ASX 300, um, a lot of sort of self-managed super funds, um, a lot of high net wealth individuals, purely equities, we're not financial planners or anything like that and we primarily focus on the domestic market. Um, although we can facilitate transactions in international markets as well, although 
it, it is difficult to sort of have a focus on everything, uh, so we do tend to focus more or less on the ASX. Okay, so ASX 300, I think Michael. Look, it, it's, I know it's starting to get a lot of coverage, but um, in sort of the mainstream commentators that you sort of hear from time to time on various sort of networks, it's obviously a company that's aligned to that lithium boom that we've been seeing. So we've seen a similar performance, maybe not quite as good as Kidman from the likes of sort of your Oracorobres and your Galaxies of this world. Uh, I'm not too across this particular name. I do think it is more domestic focused. It is a um, explorer at this stage, I think, and it's looking to make that transition into a producer. Um, but the quality of its ore and the quality of its resources is meant to be significantly high, so relative to many of its peers. Okay, there, guys. Uh, I've uh, bought some WiseTech and Altium about six, 12 months ago, so they're doing quite well. But uh, I've heard you talk about those two stocks as having very high PE ratios. Mm -hmm. So do you have a look at any of the smaller cap or micro cap tech stocks? There's one today that had a good write-up in all the papers, D13, Department 13, which got a um, large investment from a US uh, company. And they make um, systems that control drones. So if there's mm. a sec high security area, they can control the drone and stop it from flying over the high security area. Sure. But that was just one of these microcap tech stocks that I've been looking at. I just wondering if you guys have any thoughts about the smaller uh, cap stocks. What do you like in this small cap, micro cap? Um, tech I mean, micro cap space? can be fairly ambiguous. I mean, so let's just say anything sort of around the 500 mil um, mark. Um, Altium's one I've liked for a while and done incredibly well, although I do think it's starting to look fairly fully valued. I mean, integrated research is another um, interesting one. This has been around for years and listed for sort of over sort of a decade and its balance sheet's as good as any of the very high quality large caps in the market, but it does go unnoticed. They basically provide um, IT diagnostic services to very large corporations globally. I think sort of 50 out of the top uh, Fortune 500 companies, for instance, the top 10 banks in the world. So that's a, a nice, um, high-quality IT business. Um, there's one recently, sort of Live Tiles, that's had a, a deal done with Microsoft in the artificial intelligence space. So I think you really want to be looking for a number of key attributes from these IT companies. Um, they've either got to be involved in sort of artificial intelligence, um, data storage. It's, it's ideal if it's that sort of business-to-business -business, um, whereby they sell them a product and then also get the annuity style of revenue coming in the years after as they provide the services to maintain that infrastructure. Um, then there's things like Technology One, which is a, another very high quality business that's probably sort of fairly large at the moment. Um, and we've seen a lot of takeovers in Aconex recently, so you can just keep, keep scouring the market. They don't have to be out and out speculative companies. You can actually find a number of these companies that are making mm -hmm. some decent money um, and that are, do have some decent contracts in place, and they're probably where I'll be focusing my attention. Um, but again, we tend to focus more on the sort of ASX 300, maybe slightly outside of that. So we're not really focused on anything that's too microcap. Hi, Julia. Thanks. Hi. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask the panel about uh, Fluence Corporation. Um, they're trading at a 200 mil cap, uh, major shareholder, 30% shareholder, Ronald Lauder, who is uh, son of Estee Lauder, as a few of you would know. Uh, they're in the wastewater treatment and water desalination. Um, earnings for calendar 17 with US 60 mil um, so personally I think they're extremely undervalued and I probably think they're going to be one of the biggest gainers in 2018 um, they've got a backlog of US 100 mil revenue for So Dave I'm, I'm guessing that you're already holder of the shares uh, I am, I've been holding since they listed two years ago Julia, okay. I'm an IPO oh. holder so. Sure I mean, a lot, there's been a lot of interest in this space because looking from a macro perspective, it's expected that that water treatment market's going to sort of double in size in the space of five years or so. Um, I'm not too familiar with this business um, at all. Um, I haven't really looked at anything uh, in the space at the moment, purely because there probably hasn't been the momentum there. Mm. Um, and often when there's no interest and there's no share price momentum, it doesn't really matter what is coming out from the business. In this case, I think this company's come out with a couple of decent announcements in the last six months, yet it continues to sort of fall away. So there's sometimes an underlying reason that you don't really understand why. Um, and in those cases, often it's better to leave it alone. So that's my position on that. 
For an email now, this one from Daniel saying, Hi guys, your recommendation for the best performing investment fund, investing in overseas stocks and paying a good dividend. Thanks, Daniel from Sydney. So I guess the international market is where the action has been in 2017. Is it going to continue in 2018? And favourite ways to get exposure? Uh, Michael, what do you think? Um, look, there's a number of ways to take exposure. You can either take sort of ETF exposure, which gives you a broad exposure to that space. Um, then you've got the larger Australian, but focused on international investing fund managers, the likes of your Platinum Asset Management, Magellan Financial Group. Platinum has had a, a somewhat a return to form um, throughout sort of 2017. Um, they've probably had some of the better performing funds. There are some smaller alternatives out there as well, things like the Forager um, the International Fund. I think Montgomery International Fund also had a fairly good year. Um, it's difficult to sort of point out those that have a fairly high dividend yield. Obviously, international markets don't have the same tax breaks as Australian um, equity markets do. So often, um, it's lower dividends that you receive for that reason. Um, but there are a number of ones for you to go away and do your research on. There are a lot more coming into the market. It's almost the, the new Vogue space to be launching a um, international LIC or international funds. So do your research. But my advice is probably look for one with a fairly good track record um, and have a good look as to what their sort of top 10 or top 20 holdings are if you can get that much detail because it'll give you a sense of their strategy and the, not only the, the sectors they're investing in but the geographical locations as well time for an email so let's go straight to this one from Stuart. Stuart from Melbourne has sent an email asking hi can the panel please give me their thoughts on PAB Patries. I have held this stock since 2009 and have accumulated over the years some good things on the horizon I think. Um, Look it's, you've been in it for almost sort of 10 years or so um, you've been continually adding to it um, I would be careful just to ensure that it doesn't become a too big a weight in your portfolio it's okay to have these sorts of things um, in your portfolio but you need to always balance the risks. Um, the reward for this company if it was to be rewarded down the track is still some way off um, and they're just going to continually lose money year after year after year. They're going to be paying management and they're going to be paying staff and what that means is every couple of years they're going to run out of cash and they're going to have to come back to the market um, and, and do a capital raising. Um, so they're going to keep tapping you. One day something might come out, um, but that is probably the less likely outcome. If you look back through history, the number of biotechs that have been there listed on the ASX, for every 10 that don't make it, there's maybe one that does, and that's probably being generous. So just keep that in mind. Um, often a good way to play these sorts of things is build yourself a, maybe a mini portfolio, if you like. Go and find your five favourite um, micro-speculative biotechs um, and then maybe put a small amount into each of those and that way you build yourself a mini portfolio within your greater investment but with these sorts of things I wouldn't pin your hopes to it and I certainly wouldn't bet the house on it just be very careful um, going forward and continually stumping up cash. Do you have any thoughts on AU Make? I do have a small holding they only floated in October and have had a good run but have come back from 70 cents down to 53 cents. AU make. AU8 is the stock code. Make it screams of opportunism, in my opinion, trying to capitalise on this sort of clean, green Australian produce theme, Diego markets, things like that. Um, my big question mark is what is their sustainable competitive advantage? Um, they probably don't have one. Um, the fact is, once they reach a certain profit level or the profit margins get to a certain point, if they are that profitable, you're going to see a lot of competitors quickly come in. Um, and replicate what they've been able to do. And when we're talking about things like Diego markets and things like that, I think if we're sitting here in, say, five years talking about infant milk, it's very unlikely that those unconventional channels will still be open. Things will be going through the more formal, um, tr formal channels for the transaction of those particular goods. So I would be operating this space with caution. Um, it's obviously been marketed very well off the IPO. It's been much sought after. Um, but it, a lot of it is down to the name and the area that it operates rather than any sort of long-term growth in the company, in my opinion. Okay. Hi, panel. Any cheap and attractive small miners out there that I could add to my portfolio? What about you, Michael? Uh, difficult because I don't really focus that intensely um, on that space. One that we did get some clients into and get in the energy space was something like Santos. Uh, if the energy price still holds at this level and, and continues to move higher, even though Santos has had a very good run, I do feel as though 
you could see it continue to trade its way out of any troubles that it might have had looking back a couple of years now. Um, the higher Australian dollars are a benefit for them as well because a lot of their debt is denominated in US dollars. So at the moment they're in a bit of a sweet spot where they've got the Aussie dollar pushing back towards 80. Um, obviously the energy price and the oil price has pushed above 60. Um, they've been able to get their costs down significantly, reduce their headcount. And they've even started to pick up their capital expenditure program again, which will allow them to potentially um, generate some growth into the future. So that's definitely one I think is worth keeping an eye on as a bit of a turnaround story, not too dissimilar from what we saw from Fortescue Metals going back a couple of years, Whitehaven Coal a couple of years. Um, they're in that sort of sweet spot at the moment where they're doing a lot right on the company level, but they're being mm. backed up by the commodity, underlying commodity price as well. Looking at Invocare though, I guess the main issue is um, growth versus valuation. I noticed UBS just recently downgrading it to a sell. Would you be a backer of Invocare here? Um, look, it's a, a very high quality business. Um, it's a, a, almost a monopoly or certainly um, one of the major players by some way. They did try and expand overseas in recent years, but I think they came back with the tail between their legs. They've got the premium sort of um, locations, if you like, for cemeteries um, and funeral homes, etc. Um, but often share prices move for all sorts of reasons, not just valuation, a lot of it comes to sentiment. I mean, we're asking why is it sort of pulled back now from 18 to 16, but really why did it go up in the first place from 14 to 18? There's no real sort of underlying reason. Um, I was looking at this and I did notice that the premium that Invercare trades to its peers blew out significantly um, in, in the last sort of 12 months or so. It always trades at a premium to its peers in the healthcare space by about sort of 40 or 50 percent, given the certainty in earnings. We know that people are getting older, the greater proportion of the population is ageing, more people are dying. So you can rely on earnings growth into the future to some extent. But I think the premium that it was trading to its peers blew out to the extent of sort of 75, 80 percent. And now it's just a case that people have caught on to it. UBS has released its note. Um, and now it's just moderated a little bit and the valuations come back to the field, probably closer to what fair value is. Um, and to be honest with you, it probably still has a little bit further to fall if it does start to trade back on that historical premium that it has to its peers as opposed to this elevated premium. So very good business, will continue to be a good business, but it will often fluctuate just depending on sentiment um, and technical factors. And it did have a very good trend there for a while, so people probably jumped on board the trend and just wrote it. But now that bubble's been popped or that trend's been popped, I shouldn't use the word bubble necessarily too freely, there's people now taking their profits and it's just falling away like that. Thanks, Julia. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, Woolworths has had a bit of a run-up lately, and I'm wondering whether we should be taking some some <laughs> profits, whether it's a buy, hold, or sell. And do you think it can compete with all these foreign grocery companies opening up in Australia? Um, the Problems with Woolworths, if you can call them problems, are well documented and well known. Um, basically, Coles and Woolworths had the highest margins in the developed world for so long. They were a duopoly, then all of a sudden Audi and, and Costco to some extent came into the market um, and started to discount and put downward pressure on margins for the, the major players. Um, if you go into an Audi, they might stock sort of one brand of tomato sauce. If you go into Woolworths, they'll have ten there, which gives consumers great choice and, and optionality. Um, but the problem is they can't necessarily compete on price. Uh, and that's where you get the issue where they get forced to put downward pressure on margins. Woolworths has invested in lower prices, if you can, again, use those sort of words. And it's worked to some extent in that they've managed to retain or, and regain some market share from the likes of Coles. Um, but the issue is that I don't think that this competitive pressures from international entrants is going to go away anytime soon. In many ways, Audi is only just beginning and it's just starting to ramp up now into states that it previously wasn't even um, involved with. So, yes, Woolworths has had a renaissance of sorts given that it is reclaiming some of the market share that it lost from Coles, um, but I still feel as though this has a long, long way to play out and we'll be talking about this probably in five, ten years' time. Hi, um, I've got a question for two stocks that I've recently purchased. Um, one of them is Netcom Wireless. Um, I purchased it because Full year 18 revenue is going to be more than market cap, mm -hmm. um, and if we can, okay, cash wise. Uh, the other one is something I potentially want to hold long term called Nanosonics. Um, revenue, I think, long term will be quite good. And the third question given that we're 10 years into a bull market, should I be looking at a bear ETF for the S&P 500? Um, I remember looking at this one a few years ago and I haven't really looked at it since. It basically provides the infrastructure used for 3G and 4G um, technology. Um, 
The telco space as a whole has been under immense pressure and I think this has sort of been caught up in that but don't I stand corrected on Netcom um, but I must admit I'm not across the nitty gritty of what the business is going through at this point. Okay. Um, actually, this is one that we had in our most recent monthly report. I've never sort of invested in it in the past, but sort of early December started to get clients into it because it started to come off the boil a little bit. It's one of these companies that's gone through a decade of research and development and it's got their product to market and they're starting to see the benefits of that start to come through now. It's gone from being a loss maker year after year to returning its first profit this year, I think, and you can expect that to continue to grow um, into the future. So it's an interesting healthcare play that is making that transition and that's pretty much the reason um, that we like it. It's obviously something that can be used not only in Australia but all around the world and that's where these markets are starting to open up for them. Back a long way and I suppose the risk characteristics have shifted significantly sure. in the last sort of six, twelve months and that's the sort of view that we take that it could probably look to recover at least sort of half of the losses from its peak going back a couple of years or so. So yeah, it's one to keep an eye on and it's a much more mature business now. Michael. Look, it's difficult because obviously you're standing in the way of a freight train, um, but in many ways you can slowly look to reduce your net long exposure by buying into something like this BEAR um, inverse fund, um, because it, obviously if the market falls, you'll be offsetting at least your losses on your other stocks partially. Um, it's difficult to sort of call a top to this market. We've heard all the phrases like melt up, um, synchronised global growth. Um, so it's very, very difficult at this point, in my opinion, to be putting something on like this. Um, you can almost look to maybe put on options as well, that strategy that you could employ that can help maybe boost your income as well in the periods. Um, so look, for me, I wouldn't be rushing to put this on. I'd be looking to maybe go to cash, um, in little bits of cash at a time. So maybe put, say, 5% of your portfolio in cash and 10%, and that will give you some flexibility because Although the markets might have a retracement, it might be a huge crash like a GFC style event. It might be a bit more of a retracement, say 5%, 10%, maybe 20% that takes it to a bear market. Um, in that situation, I think probably cash is a bit more preferred as opposed to a bear fund because you'll at least have the funds that are deploy rather than making the psychological decision, I need to now exit my bear fund and now go fully long. It's a, it's a big step to make at once. Yes. Um I'm asking about Australian Mines, which I bought a month ago, and AMP. I know a lot of people don't like it, but there's a turnaround story, and I don't know. What do you think? Okay, so it sounds like a no from Nathan on AMP. How about you, Michael? Uh, I'm pretty much the same uh, in my thoughts on AMP. Um, going back to 2000, I think it was amongst the top 10 biggest companies in Australia. They were the best positioned company to capitalise on the ageing population and the big boom in superannuation. But it just never really worked out for them. Their earnings have consistently fallen away, the dividend per share as well. They've had a number of sort of mergers and then divestments. Companies like Henderson Group was once upon a time part of AMP, obviously AXA, etc. Um, but it just never quite seems to, to get all the aspects of that business moving in the one direct direction. They've got financial planning, they've got insurance, they've got funds management. Um, they've had a lot of passive funds in the past, and a lot of active funds which are now moving into passive funds. There's been a lot of competition emerge in that active funds management space because of the emergence of ETFs and, and, and a lot of LICs as well and that's put a lot of downward pressure on, on fees that they can charge for those passive funds. Um, and I don't really see those pressures abating anytime soon. And um, They have looked to divest a number of assets in recent times to try and sort of streamline that business. Um, there's been talk of them moving into sort of Asia. That never really quite worked. They've come back. They've had a lot of management upheaval in the last sort of few years or so. So perhaps you're seeing a lot of the negativity sort of be priced into the company and some bargain hunters coming in. But if you take a, a medium to longer term view, mm -hmm. I'd much rather be invested in those fund managers that have international exposure given what we're seeing on an international scale, the growth and all those things. And your favourite fund manager in that space? Probably Janice Henderson Group, um, just given that it trades on the lowest multiple relative to its peers. That's a company that got really hit hard by the Brexit, a lot of fund outflows. But what we've seen is they've had a merger with Janice Group from the United States. That gives them a nice distribution platform into the US. It reduces their reliance purely on the UK. And they're now starting to see fund flows, flows turn positive after being negative for a while. Um, their fund performance has been very good over, say, one, three and five years. They've also got a very diversified fund offering where it's not just equities. They've got um, fixed income, they've got property, um, alternative investments, and most of those funds have done very well as well. So 
relative to say a platinum or a Magellan, they trade on less challenging multiples, um, so that's probably a preferred pick. Thanks for taking my call, Julia. I am Pleasure. interested in the healthcare sector, uh, two stocks in particular, Cochlea, sure. COH, and then uh, the MBF. You know, Let's find out if Michael's interested in these two stocks and what he thinks of the healthcare space. Um, so healthcare, that was the best performing sector in the market in 2017, um, but it did have a torrid finish to 2016, so it sort of managed to recoup those losses. Um, and there's a lot of good quality businesses in this space. Um, I've been a big fan of it over the last couple of years and done very well off the likes of sort of your CSLs, Cochlear's, Fisher & Paykel, ResMeds. Um, but you need to be cautious going forward because we're talking about at the beginning of the show, about rising bond yields um, and what it tends to do is it tends to affect those higher PE, higher growth companies more than it does some of the others because if you plug in a higher discount price in your discount cash flow model it actually affects those with higher PEs more than it does those with low. So some of these companies need to be careful of. Cochlear, um, it's hard to sort of back against it because it is going through a good period um, in terms of the release of a new product. Um, they've managed to overcome a lot of the issues that they've had in recent years. There was a, an issue with a lot of Chinese imitation products coming into the market, taking away their market share. Over time, people have realised that the genuine article's the preferred way of doing it, although you might have to pay slightly more. Um, Cochley also went through an issue where much of their sales growth and profit growth was coming from people upgrading existing ear implants as opposed to new people getting ear implants, mm. uh, but the technology advancements in this, um, in this company have been amazing, so the Bluetooth con connectivity and all that sort of stuff. So it's a very high quality business, the, the momentum in the share price is still very good as well, so they've got that earnings momentum, share price momentum, um, but it is difficult to jump in at these lofty valuations, but a very high quality company worth looking at on any sort of buy um, pullback. Um, the other one was Monash IVF, and we're sort of talking about it in the break. There are a number of headwinds for this company or these style of businesses. Uh, a lot of competition is emerging in the space. A lot of cheaper products are coming or cheap alternatives um, are coming in. There's issues with recruitment of staff as well for some of these sorts of companies. Um, there's regulatory risk. Um, they're selling hope in many cases, but who are we really to stand in the way of people having hope? So there's all these moral arguments that are starting to come up in that space. So. Overall, I do like the healthcare space a lot. Um, however, I do feel as though they've had a very good run of late and there could be some rotation out of that space. Yeah, thanks, Julia, for taking my call. Uh, I'm looking at buying Auckland Airport, so I just want to know what you think about it. And also, we do own Westfield, and mm -hmm. what do you think about them being bought out? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, look, Westfield was having its worst year I think um, since 2011. It did manage to sort of bounce off its highs before this takeover offer came onto the table but the pressure for these sorts of malls is undeniable. You've got the specialist retailers, your Zara's etc coming in. You've got threats from Amazon and, and whatnot as well in that retail space. So the writing is very much on the wall. Uh, a lot of retailers were struggling to meet rental increases. Um, once upon a time many of, the, many of these rental agreements were linked to inflation. Inflation's obviously been benign for a very long period of time. So it's been becoming more and more difficult for Westfield to boost their earnings um, and for that reason I think it's a good get out of, of jail card for many um, of those investments, or many of the investors in Westfield.